We're ready to shake, rattle, and roll. Next on Columbus Neighborhoods. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance and for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortime Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. One of the best places for an afternoon of fun is right here at our own Ohio Stadium. Go Bucks! Go Bucks! I'm ready. We wanted to look back at some of the simple pleasures that packed a lot of fun into every minute. And one of those stories coming up is, naturally, about ice cream. So stay tuned because I think Javier gets to make a blizzard. Is that right? It is right. And I managed to not mess it up and it's a skill worth learning for sure. <laughs> Our first story though is about swimming pools. Whether you went to Crystal on the south side or Maryland on the east, some summer fun was serious business. It's not like swimming was invented when swimming pools were poured in Columbus neighborhoods. The rivers and lakes have always been used for transportation, for fishing, and for swimming. But swimming became a popular mass entertainment when Olentangy Park and other amusement parks were built at the end of streetcar lines to keep people riding on the weekends. And until nearly World War II, Olentangy Park was the place to swim. But then us baby boomers came along. And there were a lot of us. So starting in the late 1950s, early 1960s, people decided, I can make money by building swimming pools and having swim clubs. The Grandview Pool. I would walk every day from Arlington and First down to the swimming pool with my little roll of towel and suit and hang out all afternoon and then walk all the way home. We must have been very healthy because we walked so much. <laughs> The pool was sort of the gathering spot for everybody. It was an easy place to go in the summer. It was relatively inexpensive. I, I don't know, probably memberships were $5 for a kid for the year. You'd make the rounds on Friday night. You know, you'd get in a car and you'd go here and you'd go there. And then your cousin would get you into Berwick Beach, you know, so you could talk to Eastmore High School girls instead of Southside girls. The pool was the center of all summer life. You went to the pool to see who was there and to be seen as much as to swim. But there was a corner of the pool, the back left corner, where the high school kids hung out. And I learned to play bridge there. Then when we got hot, we'd go up to the deep end and dive in and play tag and so forth. I'm a South Side guy. So the oldest swimming pool I know about was Crystal Swim Club, which sat on Champion Avenue at Markson and South End. And the Crystal goes back to the 1940s. And it was a private swim club. But I didn't really realize a private swim club excluded people. They allowed no African Americans in the pool at all. So we could drive by or we could ride our bikes by, but we could not go there to swim. I managed the Grandview Pool for a long time and when the city bought it from a private owner, there was a board and the board was to keep unsavories out. So 
the Italians, the blacks, the, the poor from the other side of the river. But when the city bought it, if you could buy a membership, you were in. So that was an awakening for me to think, oh my gosh, that's so wrong <laughs> on so many levels. Maryland Pole. Yes, that was uh, the one swimming pool that I remember we went to. We as African Americans had our own little neighborhood swimming pool. For some kids, the only place to swim was the Jewish Community Center on College Avenue. And while they may not have been allowed to swim elsewhere, this pool was open to everyone. Kids from all over participated in elaborately choreographed pool pageants. After World War II, Columbus was booming. Businesses, roads, and subdivisions were springing up everywhere. And one civic leader, Mel Dodge, was convinced the city could do more for its kids. Mel loved the outdoors. He loved the open space. And he always used to talk about, keep your open spaces, because if you give them up, you'll never get them back. Mr. Dodge found a lot of value in public recreation. And he had the ability to get city government, city council, to see his vision. Under Dodge's leadership, parks and pools were constructed all over Columbus. One of them bears his name. He was talented, he was kind, he had compassion for the whole community, especially for kids. And, and he was persistent. If he had, thought he had a good idea, he wouldn't let it drop. We gave away swimming lessons. I don't know how many kids' lives Mel Dodge saved because we had all these recreational parks pools and we taught kids to swim. Gro, a high school science teacher, taught a lot of kids to swim in the 19 summers he served as a lifeguard or manager at city pools. He says being a lifeguard isn't easy. You have to remain alert. So you'd get these kids that get up on the board and you could just tell. you just look at them and they're like, and their eyes would be the size of saucers and you'd have to go get them. So you'd get a manager, they'd go in and call mom, say, hey, you just had to pull John. No, he's fine, he's fine, but we want you to sign him up for swim lessons. And so mom, grandma would sign him up for swim lessons. I like the people, I like the kids, I like being around the, the pool. There's nothing looks better than a really, really clean swimming pool with really nice water. You know, there's nothing looks better than that. I'm still like that. A lot of simple pleasures depend on the sun. Gardening, swimming, napping, that's one of my favorites. It's one of mine too. Now jazz, that's a daytime or nighttime slice of fun. And some of the best names in jazz played rain or shine in parks or clubs, and all of them made Columbus home. The 50s and 60s, and this was the period of time when uh, Mount Vernon was just on fire, oh, yeah. on fire because of all the, the great uh, jazz musicians, as well as the R&B singers. On Long Street in Mount Vernon, there was music everywhere. You could walk out of the Cafe Society and walk across the street to Skirties, oh, yeah. and it was music. Right. You could walk down the street to the next corner, and there was music. What brought in a lot of the jazz musicians, they were on that circuit, you know, coming through Cleveland and going to Cincinnati and Indianapolis. And I remember Ray Charles used to be there all the time. Oh, yeah. All the time. We'd start a, a dawn dance at 3 o'clock in the morning. At 3 o'clock in the morning, that block was full of people waiting to get in. I'm serious. I mean, it, it, was, it was great. Right. And everybody came out of there when the sun was shining when everybody came out. <laughs> there were some super musicians come out of this town. Norris Turney, who played with my father and off and on. He ended up playing with Count Basie or somebody. Of course, Harry Sweets Edison ended up with Count Basie for years. And then he ended up being Frank Sinatra's favorite trumpet yeah. player. Mm -hmm. Of course, Rossan Roland Kirk. 
Well, he played with him. <laughs> Let Jack tell you about him. We were very close. I mean, I talked to him every day. A lot of guys were jealous of him. So they thought that playing two horns and all that was a gimmick. It wasn't. That's just the way he heard his music, playing the melody or, or harmony with one horn and something else with the other. We'd be in the nightclub somewhere, and he'd meet some gal, and he'd hold her hand for a minute. He'd walk over to me and say, Jack, is she good looking? Yeah, she, she's pretty good looking. He said, man, he says, well, I didn't know whether she's good looking or not, man, her hand felt like a truck driver. <laughs> Oh, he was, he was more fun. Music that makes us cry. Love that money can't buy. Let's all search for the ring to fly. Mr. Superman. The stop was very popular, especially up in Canada. I worked with him up in Montreal. He had his own plane and everything. He was doing very well. But then he also played the organ with his feet. Right. Played piano with his feet. With his feet. His claim to fame wasn't that he played with his feet. His claim to fame that it was that he was a really good piano player. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was just something yeah. he did. Hey, Mr. Superman, I've got a job for you. Don Patterson. He was an organ player, played organ player. Hammond B3 organ. He played uh, with Sonny Stitt. What they said was the number one organ trio uh, city was Pittsburgh. When Jimmy Smith made the organ famous, a lot of organ players popped up in Pittsburgh. Yeah. But the guys always said the number two place in the country was Columbus. There were organ groups everywhere. And there was Bill Mason, there was Bobby Pierce, there was Hank Marr. Uh, there were organ groups everywhere. There used to be a club, the Skyline cat a corner from uh, Lincoln. And when you walked in the door, the first thing you saw to your left, and the stage was really about as big as this table, was an organ player. And I mean, it, it was not unusual at all to walk in there and oh, yeah. Don Patterson would be playing or somebody else famous. The Copa, that later became the Club Jamaica, it had a dance floor. So it was popular because of that. The Empress Movie Theater and the Regal, Club Regal, where everyone that was a musician came at one time or another. It's right there. Across the street from the Lincoln right Theater. Right across the street from the Lincoln Theater, yeah. The Cadillac was a small lounge. Beautiful lounge, wasn't it? Yeah, but it was really small. Yeah, it, it was small. If you sat at the bar, it was long and narrow. If you sat at the bar, like I'm sitting at the bar, there was enough space for somebody to squeeze between you and the people that were leaning up against the wall. It was just that small, but the band was yeah. elevated. Yeah, so. up behind the bar. Right. 20th, 20th and Leonard. 20th and Leonard. The Grover Washington, he was a staple in there. I mean, he was there all the time before he was well known. He, he was just a guy that played saxophone he was a, in there. He was a side man in my band. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> Grover was a lot like Rusty. Talking about Rusty Bryant. Grover could do the R&B thing really well and straight ahead jazz. And Rusty could do the same thing. You know, Rusty had that most gorgeous big fat sound. Yeah. You know, I, I, I never heard any tenor player that, that sounded any better than Rusty. He made the song Night Train. Sold a million copies, he got $600 for it. The system didn't want to give jazz its due. It still doesn't. It takes a unique mastery of your instrument to not only play it, but compose it while you're playing it. Because think about it, any time they play a song, you're recomposing the song to make it sound the way you feel about it. In the heat of the night. Nancy Wilson, she was a superstar in Japan. Like. Rock stars are over here. She went from my old man's band to Rusty Bryant's band and then from Rusty to Cannonball and, you know, and fame and all that. I saw her one time sing someplace at uh, Clyde's or one of the places and she realized that Columbus didn't appreciate her too. And she said, look, I was in LA last night. People paid good money to see me. You guys won't even let me sing. 
Nancy often said that she didn't feel valued. And it's not until uh, someone else outside validates you that people realize that you, you know, are making a contribution. Bobby Floyd is a world-class musician right now. I mean, you can go down there and see him for 10 bucks, but they'll fly to Oakland and go see Bobby Floyd, right? But they won't come to see him and appreciate him here for almost nothing. Part of it was our own fault. We, we didn't pass it on to our kids like our parents passed it on to us. But there are also not as many venues. I wish it was the good old days again. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, I mean, it really was the good old days. Oh yeah, it was, it was a golden era. And I'm so glad I grew up in it. This next story is about ice cream. It's about one of the longest running family owned Dairy Queens in the country on High Street in Worthington. And it's about the fact that I make an outstanding blizzard. Show off. On High Street in Worthington sits an American classic, Dairy Queen. The first Dairy Queen store was opened in Illinois in 1940, and since then, 6,400 stores dot the states, and they're in 27 different countries. For most towns, the Dairy Queen is the place to gather on a hot summer's day for a peanut buster parfait or the signature blizzard. Today, I'm meeting with Ron Overstreet, and I'm hoping to learn a lot more about the history of this Dairy Queen, and hopefully how to make something really tasty. Hey Ron, how's it going? Hey Javier, how are you? I'm great man, I'm excited about being here. What are we making today? Uh, I think we'll probably make a blizzard today. Let's go. Great. Well, what kind do you want to make? That's the first start. Oreo. Oreo? Yeah, Oreo. Go with the Oreo. Perfect, we can do Oreo for you. I'll do Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. There's I can make cup. it. Right, cool. I'm going to make you make them today. All so right. we're going to fill that cup about halfway with the vanilla soft serve, just like that. This is your Oreo right here. So for a small blizzard like that, you're going to put in a couple of good sized scoops in there. Good size, great it's, size, whatever. It's your blizzard, <laughs> so you can be generous to yourself with that. Uh, so need more Oreos. <laughs> put it way down in there, so you want to fill there. Just keep going, and then you can shut it there. Perfect. What we do is stick that up on that spindle, move it around a little bit. Oreo back. Right. You can take your collar off there like that, because we don't need that anymore. And you can show the world that our blizzards do turn upside down without falling out. All right. And then we can enjoy them. Uh, yes, we can. So like, how many of these blizzards do you all go through a day? Um, you know, numbers-wise, it, it's hard to t get a count on exact numbers, but I, but I can tell you several hundred a day on an oh, average day. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Bigger days, like we do Miracle Treat Day for Children's Hospital, it gets kind of crazy right now. Now, what's that about, Miracle Treat Day? Um, Children's Hospital is, is uh, Dairy Queen's big flagship uh, fundraising piece where we work with the, with the Children's Miracle Network. Okay. Um, so we do all of the money that we raise here in Central Ohio goes to our nationwide Children's Hospital. And depending on the Dairy Queen, they donate uh, all or a portion of their blizzard sales for that specific day out of the year to, to Children's Hospital. So it's a, it's, a, it's a great day for us. Now, your family has been in the uh, ice cream business for a long time, right? Um, for a very long time. All right. What's the story? Um, my uncle, Ernie Mandel, who's my, my mother's brother, um, got us involved. He started working somewhere in the early 70s, and he and my uh, mother bought into this franchise um, in 1983. So bought it from the original owner, uh, Mr. Kenny Bang, so okay. or the second family in this particular Dairy Queen, so. All right, cool. Now you're gonna be able to pass it down. You got young ones coming up. Uh, I do, I, there's uh, actually five kids at home. Uh, some, <laughs> oh, of wow. them, some of them talk about working. Uh, my, the youngest boy, Griffin, he's, uh, uh, he's all about uh, taking over at some point. He's ready to take over now, but oh, he's, wow, he's wow. only 13, so not quite ready yet, so. Okay, all right. So you live a block away, you can just walk to work. Yeah, literally, literally, it's, it's, literally it's about a thousand feet away, so. But that's uh, one of the cool things about this Dairy Queen is that it's in a neighborhood. Like, do you get that a lot? Like a lot of families oh, come oh, here? Oh, very much. So we're very much, uh, you know, very much a walk-up business. He's been on this corner since 1956. So wow, wow. A very much a part of the neighborhood. So you've seen a lot of families coming through, a lot of kids growing up. Yeah, a lot, of, definitely, definitely a lot of kids growing up. Um, a lot of people that come back through that uh, talk about their grandparents bringing them to the Dairy Queen. Uh, used to be an old 
Jubilee grocery store that used to sit on the opposite corner over here from us. You know, that, that was pretty much the places that were available to work in Worthington was the Dairy Queen and the Jubilee. So I okay. get lots of people that come up and mention working at the Jubilee and being across from the Dairy Queen and all the other businesses and, and work opportunities the kids have now have really come along since since we've been around. So. Okay. So you can say a lot, of, a lot of the successful people here in Worthington got their start at Dairy Queen. I, 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 you know, I, I, would, have to, I would have to agree. Yeah, <laughs> it, is, it is the one place you know, people reference, you know, when I run into people away from the store and, and talk about Worthington and mention the Dairy Queen and they know right where the store is at. They know my neon sign that sits out front. Uh, and we even get people that uh, stop by the Dairy Queen and take pictures of that neon sign that never walked through my doors. They, wow. they, they appreciate that, that nostalgia, that, that classic sign that we still have out front. All right, well, it's a hot, beautiful day in Worthington, and I'm going to go ahead and indulge in this blizzard before it melts because, uh, you know, this is some good stuff. So, And, and I made this, right? So you, I earned you, it. You did, so. I earned yeah, absolutely. this blizzard. Yes, there you go. Well, thank you so much for hanging out absolutely. with us. Absolutely. Glad to have you. I appreciate it. Four three two one zero. It's one of the nation's most intriguing zip codes. How to come to Columbus? Find out about that story and more at Curious C Bus, where you submit a question online, and if voters agree, we report the story together. Look for stories, submit a question, or log on for a voting round at wosu.org/curious. They used to say in Kentucky that there are three R's, reading, writing, and Route 23 to Columbus, because for years there was a steady stream of Appalachians who headed here for jobs. And when they came, they brought bluegrass music, which had a profound effect on entertainment in Columbus. When people move from the mountains up to Columbus, they, they bring their culture with them. Here's the first number. Don't say goodbye if you love me. And that culture does, of course, include their music. And so I think a lot of the people who migrated up here from uh, Eastern Kentucky and from West Virginia did bring their music with them. John Hickman's father moved to Columbus from Kentucky looking for work. John would find his calling as a musician. And he learned his craft playing banjo in the bluegrass bars and clubs on Parsons that catered to the Appalachians working on the South Side. It was relaxation for them, I think, which meant dancing some if they want to, wanted to, or uh, just sit there and drink beer until they couldn't drink anymore. Parsons Avenue probably had uh, three that I can think of. Uh, another one right on Marion Road, um, a couple over here on High Street. At one time, there was probably uh, uh, five down here that, that, that played. It was a mixed crowd. I mean, there was probably people there from Tennessee, uh, Indiana, you know, of course, Kentucky, and uh, a lot of Kentuckians in a while back that time. Sounds like happy, good time, uh, dance music even, uh, but if you listen to the lyrics then, there's something sad about it. It's as if the music is trying to overcome the sadness of the situation that's being described. You know, up north in an urban environment, this was a way to hold on to uh, home. They, they were bars where the, where the working class people would go. And uh, yeah, some, some of those got pretty rough. Well, as they put it now, it would be a knife and gun club, you know. But uh, it was rough, uh, but that was part of it. Well, the, the Astro Inn, for one thing, had a reputation for being kind of rough. However, I never got in on any of that. And you had to be wary and you had to be cautious and you had to be sure you didn't offend the wrong people. But by and large, the guys who were going to fight were going to fight among themselves, and they were on the other side of the wall. The music was in one half room in, in the, the bar, and the serious, serious uh, professional drinkers were on the other side. They left us alone, we left us, them alone, and everybody had a good time. It was fun. I, it, you know, the music was good, of course. People were friendly. I always felt welcome there. And uh, we always we try to do a couple gospel numbers. I always said if there's a, every place needed it, it was that place. <laughs>
Thanks for being with us. And remember, you can catch all of our episodes on columbusneighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WSU mobile app. And you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by. At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance. And for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Wartime Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. <laughs>